Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This week, I'm talking to Izzy Abulila about his stunning extra-long exposures, as well as some interesting experiences he's had along the way. Izzy likes to say that he's just a normal guy with a passion for photography, but he's much more than that. He can't help but rise before sunrise and head out into the dark, camera in hand, looking to capture the landscape in the pre-dawn gloom. He shoots exclusively with the Fuji medium format digital system. Specialising in the practice of long exposure, Izzy captures the often unseen beauty by the art of simplification, presenting a unique view of the world where time is expressed in physical form. Originally from Liverpool in the UK and now living in Australia, Izzy is dedicated to exploring and sharing iconic and lesser known locations around his local area and across Australia. He runs a popular YouTube channel where he shares his journey approach and camera techniques and by doing so connects and learns from the viewer through comments and suggestions. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi Izzy, welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Well, thanks for the opportunity to chat. That's uh, an absolute pleasure. I've uh, been following your stuff for uh, uh, quite some time and really pleased when you uh, said that you were happy to come on board. And uh, so I, I guess let's start with what got you started. How did you, how did you get into photography and what, what's your earliest photography memory? Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a long, long road. Um, to photography, I suppose, um, as, uh, as part of work, um, I worked in a art centre. Uh, it was a college and art centre. And having an IT background, I taught uh, IT to a whole heap of visual artists and music tech students and one of the groups that, that I had to teach uh, basic IT to uh, were the photography students. And at that point, it was just, uh, I was just blown away with, uh, with the um, ability to create something that most people just walk past every single day. And I think, I think working with those, those kids, I think that stuck with me for quite a while. So that was my, my early 20s. Uh, and you have to realize that I didn't actually own a camera until my mid 40s. So I've only really had a camera for the past eight years. Before that, yep. just wasn't part of my uh, kit bag, so to speak. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, so I had a, a background in, I taught kids. Um, 3D games development and as part of that to do textures I used to make them go out and take photographs of bricks and concrete and things like that so they could use those textures sure. uh, but I never I never did it myself I was always okay. went with them and the way they they did it and I, I didn't get a camera myself until um, I arrived in Australia which was uh, 12 years ago now and then um I think it was the landscape that just meant I needed to, I needed to capture it. Yeah. And initially I was taking photographs only to send um, to family and friends back home. Mm -hmm. and just to say, wow, you just would not believe this place. Just look at this. <laughs> um, I think that's when I started. Uh, they must've been sick of me because I was sending a hundred pictures a week. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and holiday snaps, you know how it is, Grant. They were not, they were not photographs. They were nothing. They were nothing special. They were just literally pull out a camera. And I think I had the, I think it was the Olympus um, OMD. Uh, I think it was the EM1. Yep, yep. Yeah, so, you know, micro four thirds. Yeah. Little yep. camera, little dinky retro camera um, that I could fit in my pocket, pop it out and snap away. And then, yeah. That was that was probably the start. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So I guess, judging by your accent, you're from the UK. Yes. Originally. Yeah. 
well picked up. <laughs> yeah, from Liverpool in the UK. Yeah, I thought, um, I, I thought it was there, there or uh, around the, uh, the Lancashire area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you weren't too bad. Uh, yeah, the, the the northwest. So Lancashire's part of that area. So yeah, yeah. Born and bred. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So what made you come out to Australia? What was the uh... Uh, the, the the wife uh um so I, I met my wife back in obviously in the uk and i think she got to her i think it was her fifth i think it was her fifth winter it might have been the fourth winter and she said i can't take this anymore right i'm going back to australia and i'm really pleased she followed up with are you coming <laughs> <laughs> um so Never been, and I went. Yeah, okay, we'll give that a go, and, and that's what we that's what we did. Okay. So that's where I was, uh, that's where I, you know I said earlier on about um, uh, I, you know I'm getting used to just packing packing the house up and just moving um, because on a on a whim that's that's what we did. Yeah. We packed up, and uh, obviously she came back to Australia, and I landed in Australia. Um, and yeah, and I was, uh, we, we landed in Perth and the first morning I was there, uh, we were at a, a little harbour, uh, called, uh, Mindari, yep. Mindari, Mindari, I think it is. And, uh, and I just remember looking out and it was just, everything was blue and golden and just went on forever. And coming from the UK where everyone's packed like sardines you know, cheek by jowl. It was just, it was just, I just didn't believe there was that much space anywhere. Yeah, where um, Western Australia is definitely the place for space. Oh, well, yes, yes, yeah, true. Both the interior and and looking west. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I just sat there having an eggs benedict and I went, Do you know what? This this is just home. And that was the first morning. I've wow. never, never looked back since. Uh, fair enough. That's good. Cool. So after you got your uh, point and shoot and you started, uh, you know, sending back your, your, your holiday snaps or your, um, um, you know, point and shoot snaps or whatever, what made you start to take it more seriously and take it to the next level? Um, I, I've, I've always tried my best to do the best I can, um, whatever I do. Um, I think it's probably something... It's something internal that just drives me to try and do the best I can. And I think the turning point was I, I, I bought a tripod and I also bought, I think they were called a 7.5 filter system mm -hmm. by Lee. Yep. And they made that for micro four thirds. Um, and, I, I, and I bought them, uh, I suppose, one of those uh, knee-jerk reactions I just... I think I saw a lot. I, 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 I know I, I saw some long exposure photography, and I thought, "Wow, it just blew me away." And I thought, "I've I've got to have a go at that." Yeah. So I, I just quick look on on Google, and it said what you needed was a tripod and a filter system. So, so that's what I that's what I got, and then off I went. Uh, and at the time, I didn't even realize that you needed an adapter ring for the for the. Wow. To the lens <laughs> so i turned up for my first shoot i had all these bits and pieces and then i quickly realized that it was just never going to work it yeah. just wouldn't fit together because i didn't have the adapter ring to fit the, the, the well, that's the, part the, of the joy of, of learning photography i guess isn't it <laughs> it is yeah by yeah by beating yourself up so <laughs> so I, I had to, i had to have a little think at that point and thought you know, you're doing the best you can, but is your best good enough here? Um, but I persevered and uh, got got that adapter ring, and 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 that was it. I was I was away, and I think I was hooked on. I was hooked on long exposure at that point. Yep. Uh, specifically, you know, very long exposures. I really wanted to push uh, the what my my equipment to its absolute limits, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, okay. with the uh, Olympus. Um, it, it was it was great for everything, but it was extremely poor when it comes to long exposure. It was yeah. probably the noisiest camera on the market um, for what I wanted it to do. It's a great little camera, but just 
that was that was the one bugbear with it. And I couldn't bear myself to use the um, the noise reduction um, on it because I'd regularly take eight to ten minute exposures, and the thought yep. of sitting there for another ten minutes to, to create a black screen was just it was too much. So yeah, fair enough. Um, and that pushed me to buy um, the Nikon, um, and it it wasn't a it wasn't again. It, I think it was a knee jerk reaction, so that wasn't a a deliberate choice by checking out Canon, checking out Nikon. I just walked in and went, "What? What do you? What do you think the best camera you've got? DSLR?" <laughs> and he went, like, "It was the D eight hundred at the time." He went, "Well, well, this is pretty good." I went, "Sold. Give me it." Was it the most expensive one in the shop? <laughs> it probably, it probably was. Yeah. Um, that, that's usually what you get when you ask a, a salesman what. What's Silly the- question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then, of course, you not know. Not saying that salesmen are dishonest. But yeah. No, 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 that's that's true. But I did ask for, for whatever the best they had. I'm glad. I'm sure they had better. Um, but he probably looked at me and gauged it at, at the right level. I think. Yeah, fair um, enough. And and then it was and then it was like I had to wait then because I couldn't afford the leaf filter system, uh, yeah. which it was at that time. So I had to I had to buy that piece by piece almost. Yeah. Uh, and uh, automatically I, I gravitated towards water. Um, I suppose long exposure and water go hand yeah. in hand anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, I did, I did, I, last week I did a check on my Instagram feed, and I think there's about, there's about 470-odd pictures on there, mm-hmm. and there's only seven that don't feature water. So that's uh, that pretty much told me that I'm addicted <laughs> to water <laughs> in whatever form that is. Yeah, I've never, never done that exercise myself. I, I should have a look and uh, see what the percent. I, I know it will be a very high percentage because seascapes are what I, you know, I, I am passionate yeah. about. But uh, yeah, they, them waterfalls and uh, you and you know around Sydney Harbour and whatever around the city. Um, it's hard to hard to take a shot that doesn't have some water in it somewhere. Well, that's true. Yeah, you, you think, particularly this good. week where it's been raining now for about eight days solid. <laughs> yeah, and, and and twice or three times the normal rain too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you point your camera. It's going to find water. It's going to hit water, or water's going to hit you. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's true. That's true. Um, but on, on, on the on the waterfront, I'm not sure, uh, and that wasn't a that wasn't a film link then. But on the on the waterfront, I think I think it's probably uh, in my blood because well, my father was uh, a merchant seaman, yep, and uh, Liverpool is probably or was uh, one of the largest ports, um, well, worldwide for a long, long time. Yeah, um, and my formative years growing up, you know. You're five and six years old, and your mum kicks you out for the day. Uh, and we spent we spent pretty much every day during the summer holidays down at the docks, you know, clambering up and over jetties, and avoided being smacked around the back of the head by the dockers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the smell and the sounds of water has always it's always been alongside me um, for for an awful long well, for most of my life. Yeah, and I yeah. think I only really noticed it when I lived further inland than I normally do. So when we were in, in WA, I lived pretty near the water. And then we moved to Melbourne. And uh, I was, you know, an hour away from the water. Yep. And I, I think I really felt that then, um, being so far away from, from the sea. Yeah, yeah. So what was it, I guess, uh, about pushing your gear to the limit that, you know, made you want to do that and, you know, sort of obviously forced the, the, the gear upgrade because you weren't getting the results that you wanted. What, what was it about that sort of long exposure photography you were, you, you were, that intrigued you and motivated you, I guess? That I, I think it was, and I still think it's uh, the magic of long exposure. Uh, I think, I think if you, if you go out into the countryside or, or even along the coast, wherever you are, you can take a photograph that represents 
um, the scene, the emotion, um, mm-hmm. how you feel. Um, and it's, it's almost, you know, it's almost, it's a story of that place. It's almost a direct representation of what you can see and tangibly understand. Uh, with long exposure photography, especially when you go to the lens of some of my photography, is that, is that you, you don't know, you anticipate what it's going to look like, but you don't actually know what you're going to get. And the longer you have to wait, I think the longest, I think the longest exposure that I've done, I think it was 27 minutes. Wow. That's, um, that's massive. Yeah. 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 It, it came out quite noisy. I have to say it wasn't really noise. There was a, quite a few hot spots that I had to clean up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that was, that was down um, at uh uh, at uh, the pinnacles in um, in in uh, in Victoria, so yeah, at, um, yeah, the really pushing pushing the gear because you it's it's that moment of um, discovery when when the the process is finished and then that image just appears. Yeah, um, I think I purposely went away from Olympus because Olympus give you the option. Uh, in addition to see the photograph develop on the back on the screen. So you can see, you know, quite how it's going and what it looks like. And then you can stop the shutter should you wish. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't like that. I didn't, that didn't, that didn't do it for me. Interesting. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to see it. I wanted, I wanted to wait. I wanted to then, um, I suppose, determine what that shutter speed should be for the effect that I want to happen. And, tell the story of that image and then it's either when it comes up it's make a break um so it's either there and it's worked out the way i want to sometimes it works out and exceeds what you expected and you know quite a few times it's the other way and yeah. you think why did i bother with that because yeah, <laughs> it's a waiting game yeah absolutely uh, I, I get what you mean in terms of that uh anticipation that you have you know, uh, before the, the, the shot is actually finished or the exposure is finished, you know. Um, I mean, I've, I, I think the longest I've done is about 11 minutes or so. So, you know, now we're, now we're near the 27 minute. Um, but then I've also done, uh, I, I do quite a lot of bracketing now in, in doing that with, the combination of very long exposures as well. You know, I could yeah. probably add up to, I've got shots where I know I've added up to probably about 50 or 60 minutes, so over an hour of exposure time in a single shot, but no one exposure over over about that 10-minute period. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it, it is, a. I think it's a very different way of looking at the world as well, you know, because, you know, all of the detail in terms of the water and sky, you know, pretty much disappears at, at those th- those lengths. You know, it, it is. It's it's almost like it's uh, because you know humans, you know, are, are fleeting creatures. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're around. You know, if we're lucky, you know, to seventy to ninety years ish. You know, if we're if we're if we're if we're blessed and we're lucky enough um, to live that long. And, and so our our senses and our perception is all based on that that time frame. Um, long exposure is something that uh, you know a, a tree or something that's more inanimate would see. It would yeah. just stoically stand there while the world passes it passes it by, mm. uh, and its perception would be different it wouldn't see the individual drops it wouldn't see the individual waves uh, because its lifespan is so much longer it would it, it it would it would blur it you know it would just elongate it and stretch mm. its perception somewhat that's why you can't hit a, a damn fly while it's flying is because it's got a lifespan of four to five days yeah so time for it is so so much quicker yeah, so we're, we're so much it. slower than they are. Yeah. Absolutely. And and that's the sort of um, kick, I suppose, that, that I get out of that long exposure photography because it gives you a glimpse 
into a into a different time frame, a different perspective yeah. um, that that we just don't normally uh, would we just wouldn't see it normally. We need to utilize something to stretch stretch that time um, a little bit, and 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 long exposure photography is it. I suppose I think it was about a year ago that that even some of my long exposure photography just wasn't cutting it. Yep. I went through a period where I was doing ultra longs and black and whites, and um, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. And I will go back to my black and white. I haven't purposely shot black and white for probably about two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I mean, like, forget COVID in between. So a, a year before COVID. Um, so we, we call that, what, BC? Yeah. <laughs> before COVID. <laughs> um, so yeah, for a year before COVID, I probably was going. I was I was doing less, um, going out to shoot black and white, mm. and moving more into into color. And I think that's really cool. For the last year, I've been concentrating on shooting way before dawn. Yep. So I've been shooting at uh, nautical twilight. So that's up to an hour before the sun. Yeah. crests the horizon and uh, and i know that if i arrive at a, at a place you, it's pitch black um but if i set up and i set the camera if it's an hour before sunrise for eight minutes i know i'll see something that that will appear that i can't even never mind that i can't even anticipate it'll be something that i can't even see yeah because i'm in the pitch and pitch black yeah. And so that's, I suppose that's a double whammy now. So I'm getting uh, long exposure and I'm getting it out of pitch blackness, you know? Yeah. And no, at the I, moment, I, I know exactly what I've, I've played around with a little bit of that myself. And uh, it is, it, it is a, a, a very different sort of photography to, uh, you know, that, I mean, the, the standard blue hour sort of before and after sunset, you know, where you can sort of see, yes, there's, there's light hitting those clouds or, you know, the, there's that glow in the, in the horizon, you know, and, and if you're lucky, you might get a few reflections or some lighting on the, on the water or something in front of you. But uh, yeah, that, that pre-dawn darkness, uh, as you say, that nautical twilight is a, is a different game altogether. It is. And, it, and it's surprising the amount of colour that, that is refracted from the you know because you're talking the, the the sun's probably between six and twelve degrees below the horizon. Yeah. But there is if if you if you if you get it right and and of course it's the weather gods and Mother Nature that helps you out. If you've got that high, if you've got that high cloud and there's enough of it, you will see that you know you'll have a dull red glow yep. that's sort of just ephemeral and up there. But you you do an eight minute exposure and that that color, uh, I think I think uh, that color intensifies because you remember that your camera not only collects light, it also collects the color of light. Yeah. And so because it's collecting color, and if it's a very faint red, uh, that red will intensify in the final image. And I've had. <laughs> That's a, that's my dog. Sorry, um, I, I've had images where the light has gone very quickly from um, yellow to blue over the course of a long exposure, and the resulting color is actually quite green. So yeah. you can get green clouds, you know, and you think, you know, I, th- I thought something was wrong with my camera at first, you know, uh, when everything was just tinged in green and um, had to do a bit of research, and it's it's collecting different color photons that yep. over time blends so you can get real magentas um the deep deep ruby reds um and greens and on colors um that, that just pop into your into your imagery so it's almost like alchemy in a way yeah it's quite cool. fascinating when when you said you were doing black and white, were you going out and shooting in black and white? So setting the um, the camera to mono, or were you uh, you know doing a black and white conversion of a color image? Uh, no, I was setting the camera to, to mono and just purely shooting for sure. um, 
form, you know, uh, texture and light. I think mm-hmm. they were the they were the thing. I think I think I think form is probably still with me. Um, but yes, it was it was really about uh, about capturing the bare minimum uh, of that image that that really speaks to itself. So it's about changing tonal contrast. Um, I mostly, I, I still mostly shoot uh, contra jaw, so I usually shoot into the light. Yep. Which gives you a high contrast scene, um, which is usually favourable for for black and white. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you don't get you don't get the tonality that some black and whites need. Yeah. So you don't get that spread. You have to shoot away from the sun for that. Um, but no, I still, I'm, I'm very stubborn. So I'm determined to shoot into the sun regardless. <laughs> and I want that tonality um, yeah. as well as that high contrast. And uh, and it really makes you a master of, of looking at the conditions. So uh, one of my images uh, was in the top uh, 30 for Australian Photographer of the Year, which I was quite proud of. Uh, but that image took me nearly four years to get. Yeah. I kept going back and back and back and then it wasn't right. It wasn't right. I needed the wind to blow the clouds in a certain direction. Yep. I needed I needed the the flow and the and the uh, to come in a different direction. Um, and it just yeah, it took me it took me about four years before I thought this is the one. I was so nervous. Yeah. Well, this is everything I want. Let's it's going to turn out and and it did. So yeah. So that's probably. I think after that shot, I probably went off black and white for a while. <laughs> because I thought that I'd nailed it after so long, yeah. and I, I didn't want I didn't want the next one to be rubbish. Yeah, I, I didn't want to fail at the next one, so maybe maybe that had an effect on me. And I, so did, did, when, in saying that, did did you feel that if you'd sort of gone out and you know the conditions weren't quite what you wanted, because um, obviously you're going into the field with a concept of what you're what you're trying to pull together um, with did you see that as you know taking a backward step? No, strangely enough, I, I I was I knew when I was going out and I had a picture in my head. I was trying to I was trying to force the image out of out of sheer will. I had an image in my head that I wanted. I was trying to force it. Uh, arriving at, at that particular location within within a minute, you know it's not going to happen, and so yes. you revert back to. Okay, so what what is this now telling me? I don't. I didn't see that as a failure. It was just that I was on a hunt, and if I couldn't get that, then I was gonna. I was gonna. Uh, I was gonna search to find something else that that spoke to me. Got it. Uh, yeah. That's probably the way it was. Uh, so I never felt disappointed uh, that I didn't get it. I always thought that one day that will happen. Sure. Uh, I've still got another picture in my head that that I've had since since I've picked up the camera and really want, and that's not happened yet. <laughs> so I've got, I've got an idea and a picture in my head and I've just haven't found the location for it yet. Fair enough. So, so how, much, how much planning are you putting into a, uh, a, a shoot like that? So prior to, prior to actually turning up and, you know, setting up your tripod, um, what, what are you doing, I guess, to, to make sure that conditions are right or, you know, and yeah. every day I go out, I know that, you know, regardless of how many forecasts I look at and whatever, it's, it's never quite yeah. what it says it's going to be. <laughs> no, I hate, I hate forecasts. I, I still <coughs> use them. Um, I still use them, but I absolutely hate them um, because they either tell you it's everything's perfect yep. and you go out on the knot um, or it tells you that you shouldn't go out and then you're umming and ahhing and wasting time deciding to go out yeah, if you don't, to go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that will suit it. So, so yeah. I, th- I think I'd, I, what I've what I've learned to do now is a, uh, as you know, I mostly do dawn. Uh, yeah. I mostly I mostly do dawn because I'm maybe it's because I'm antisocial and the fact that uh, <laughs> when I arrive somewhere, I want it to myself. If you go yeah. at sunset, you know, chances are. There's people sitting around, and you know, it's their right. They absolutely, are, we, we're here to share. Uh, but I know sunsets are often uh, more difficult in terms of 
uh, people being about. Um, and yeah, and for me, I prefer that just me and the object, whatever it is I've come to photograph. Um, I don't mind other photographers. It's just, it's just when you get people just wandering about and just you know doing uh, enjoying them, enjoying the place. It's just yeah. not for me because I want to capture something, and I tend not to have uh, people in my in my shots if I can help it. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, quite kind of the same. Uh, I don't I don't mind the odd person in the shot. Uh, it depends on where I am and and where where I'm shooting and what I'm shooting, but. Uh, yeah, I try try to get as many uh, shots as I can without people. Maybe yeah. maybe we share the same so antisocial tendencies. I don't know. But. Yeah, yeah, it's, well, it's not that. I think it's, to be honest, I'm going to use another word that's probably even worse. It's probably selfish, in the fact that you know I've I've come here and I I have a connection with this object and I want to uh, I want to show it off to what I believe is the best way that I can. Yeah. And anything else is either a, is a distraction, you know. Uh, saying that, I do take my, you may have seen on on the videos that I produce, I do take along our, our puppy, he's not a puppy, he's three now, uh, Rafi. So I don't mind sharing it with him uh, because uh, because he's, he's great company and he doesn't chatter in my ear most of the time. Um, and and I, can, I can put him on a lead and, and move him out the way if necessary. That doesn't um, ask you what you're doing. <laughs> No, 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 and he's he's he always he, well he's always impressed. But whatever I do, so that that'll work. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I think I think it's I think it's partly selfish in the fact that um, I want to do the best I can, and early mornings are the time when there's the least possible um, chance of 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 distraction. Um, uh, but I love it when when we bump into other photographers. Um, that that's having obviously that's going to happen, and it has happened many times, and it, and they've always been, it's always been a, a good feeling to have people around all taking images of the same thing in different ways and, yeah, yeah. and chatting away and what are you doing, how are you doing that, and that's that's interesting. I don't I don't mind that. Uh, maybe that's a shared outlook. Yeah, and we're all trying to do the same thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, and and plus, uh, as I said earlier, that I do nautical twilight. Uh, I don't know what it is, but um, nautical twilight in the morning um, seems generally to be uh, better, cleaner colour, deeper colour than uh, nautical twilight of an evening. Uh, I don't know whether that's because of there's more dust in the air because of the day. Yeah, um, that sort of dilutes it slightly. It gives you beautiful tones, but it's just a different. It's a different color. It's more yeah. pinky off an orange, whereas in the morning you get if you get it, you get deep ruby reds. Yeah. Um, so there is a slight difference there. Uh, but in terms of planning, yes, I, I I check the weather. So it's the normal, you know, Skippy Sky is quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, YR dot no. Uh, is is another one? I don't know if you if you know that one. I haven't heard of that one, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly it's got Scand a tag on there. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's a Scandinavian one. I think it's uh, okay. it it it, um, it 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 really is good. It gives you uh, it gives you a uh, if you go to details, it gives you a breakdown of the cloud um, in terms of everywhere. It gives you that you know the um, low, uh, middle, and high. But it also gives you dew point, also gives you altitude clouds, so clouds that are higher. And for me doing early photography, clouds that are higher than high cloud, they're the ones that really um, yeah. light up. They carry the light across from the other side of the world yeah. um, through that refraction. So, yeah, why, why I don't know is, is, is one I, I check uh, before I go out. And uh, you, and you can you know it'll do it worldwide, so it's so it's pretty good. Um, and of course, being by the sea, I always check the tide, and just as importantly, the swell. Yeah. Um, and the wind direction. Uh, that's that's the, the that's the safety really. Um, the swell's the safety. Tide is because it depends where you're going, whether you need high or low tide to get to where you want and get the look you want. 
Yeah. Um, but I'm always mindful of swell. Um, I've uh, one or two uh, hiccups with swell where I used to check the tide and not the swell. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had a uh, I had a, a DA50 on my tripod on a on a on a ledge, and I had a wave that came up, hit the ledge behind me, splashed up probably over my head, and came down and took my other bag with the spare camera in it and two Gosh. lenses, and off it went. Yeah. So, but I had hold of the DA50 at the time on my tripod, but I could have easily gone with it because. Yeah, uh, it was just one of those waves. It, it, you know, the the tide was in, but it it was it was the swell. It literally hit hit the shelf along one side, flew along the the wall, and then came back down on top of me. And yeah, I, so I, I, I know the sort of wave. I've uh, I've been uh, made a little damp um, once or twice through through some of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I yeah. haven't lost any gear that way. But uh. Uh, yeah, no, that was that that was an expensive. An expensive outing, um, but uh, and it, and it made me realise that I need to do a little bit more checking, um, sure. especially climbing over rocks. Lakes are great, but uh, if I'm by the sea, then I need to be responsible and really do that check. So that so yeah, so tide and swell wind is is if I'm going towards the sea, then that's what I check. Yeah. So you're sussing out your uh, locations on Google Earth or are you going to places that you kind of have physically checked out yourself beforehand or uh, a, mixture, a mixture a mixture of, 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 of all of that. I think uh, I've only been in South Australia now for not even a year. Mm-hmm. So I'm still sort of getting used to the to the to the landscape and topography and I don't know what's um, uh, what's available to be shot yet. So sure. I, I suppose I'm checking other Instagrammers first of all, um, in terms of if I know I'm going to go. So if we're going on a on a short break, um, then I'll probably check Instagram and check that area and just see what sort of photographs, what sort of views are available. I use Google Maps, as you said. And often drop the little the little man yep. onto a, a little blue circle so I can have a look around. Um, I zoom in very closely to Google Earth, uh, Google Earth and, and Google Maps uh, with the terrain on an inch along the coast. Yep. Um, I found several um, out of the way hidden broken jetties that way. Okay, yep, mostly in Victoria. Um, but I found one. I found one here in South Australia. Uh, that, as far as I'm aware, has there's, there's actually three of them, um, very large pilings, and as far as I can tell, they've not been photographed at all okay. by anyone. Um, so, um, so I'm looking to go and photograph them when I get the opportunity. Um, yeah, so I yeah, I'm find those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. So long as they. It looks unique, and I'm excited. Um, I've I've been there and I've seen them. Um, whether I can make a photograph of them is yet to be seen. Um, the 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 difficult where they are in terms of vegetation growing. So I might have to wait to winter, so it dies back. Uh, but I'm thinking about that now. Um, I, I think moving to South Australia has made me made me widen. Uh, what I photograph, yeah, um, because there's it's very modern the coastline here in terms of jetties, yeah, and yeah. as beautiful as they are, you know they don't sing to me like um, broken bits of wood and iron. Yeah. Um, the character's just not there for me. As beautiful they are, really are beautiful, but I need to work a little harder now. So I'm up for the challenge. Um, so the, you know, I'm, I'm looking now at salt pans. I'm looking at um, uh, at the many ruined buildings and abandoned farm buildings that are around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm like the desert. You know, there's there's desert within quite an easy drive. Um, we've got the Flinders Ranges and things. So yeah, no, it's 
I'm excited again, uh, but I'm also a beginner again yeah. when it comes to that photography. Uh, waterfalls, for instance, you mentioned them. Um, I've taken two waterfalls in my life, um, yet there's about half a dozen in less than an hour's drive from here. So, sure. uh, so I'm waiting for I'm waiting for the rainy season and. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting time. plenty of that at the moment. So uh, too much. Yeah, waterfalls are. Uh, to be honest, though, I think at the moment, you know, some of them are a, a little too full of water. So, um, you know, you can go and uh, a it can be really dangerous, but b you know it doesn't make a great shot when there's just torrents and torrents of brown, you know, dirty. Well, I won't say it's dirty water. It's carrying a lot of dirt. You know, it's, it is. It's churned up, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It just it just doesn't look great as a uh, as a shot, you know. It's not. It makes makes for spectacular um, videos, I guess, you know. But uh, yeah. it, it not not necessarily great great for photography. Also, really hard to keep yeah. your, uh, your your gear dry too. You're uh, always having to wipe off the lens because uh, yeah. the spray coming off those sorts of torrents is uh, a, a bit of a challenge. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm still working on a project in terms of waterfalls around the uh the illawarra escarpment um and i saw a, i saw a new one yesterday actually that i've never seen before um up behind Ostermere coming off the top of the escarpment and wow. it's literally just because of the amount of water that's you know piled up on on there and uh, is pouring off the side and, it's just yeah. work its way through yeah yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately well, i didn't have my camera with me at all to uh okay. to, to get any kind of <laughs> shot of it but uh <laughs> Uh, it's always the way, isn't it? Yeah. Always the way, you know. But yeah, no, those they're, they're unique once in a lifetime, you know, um, um, shots or you know, once a decade shots. So yeah. fingers crossed, you get back. Yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm, I'm planning to head down there again uh, this week because um, there's more rain forecast. So there's <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Good, good chance it'll still be fine. <laughs> As long as you're safe, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Sure no, um, uh, it, it's not somewhere. Uh, I, I think what I'll be doing with that particular one is uh, staying at the bottom of the escarpment and using a long, long lens because it's it's literally off the top of the off the top of the cliff. And, uh, wow. Yeah, I think climbing up to get in, into the bottom of it is um, not going to be easy. For one thing, but also it's just yeah. I, I think it's um, pretty, pretty wild and, and scrappily bushland as well to get through. So anyway, we'll, yeah. and we'll then, see, see and what happens. If you get there, is it, is it going to make it? Yeah. yeah, is it going to make a, good, a better shot after all of that? You know, that's the thing. Yeah, well, that's it. It's it's all about the composition and uh, you know whether or not it uh, whether or not it works. You know, and. You know, to be honest, it, in that location coming off the cliff, it's a, the the hillside going up to the bottom of the actual cliffside. The cliffside's vertical, um, yeah. but the hillside going up to it is is very steep as well. So if, even if you did get to the seat of the falls where it, it it's hitting the the top of the that um, the hillside, um, it's pretty much just going to be a straight up shot. Up the up the cliff, yeah. which I yeah I just can't see it working. So I think yeah. uh, standing further back using a longer lens is is probably going to be the way to go. To capture it, no, no, best of luck with that. Yeah. Especially seeing when the rain stops, it'll go. You know, yeah, it'll disappear. It, it, literally five minutes after the rain stops, it'll stop. <laughs> Dry up, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, we'll 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 see what happens with that one, but. Um, I, see, uh, I did see another couple of uh, falls. Um, somebody posted one the other day, I think, uh, down at Taramata Beach, which I, I shoot a fair bit, uh, which is, yeah, it's a, it, it's a nice beach because for photography because there's quite a lot of rock formations around there. But, um, you know, there's, it, it's not one with a surf club or anything. So, you know, it's a little bit less accessible than some of the other ones but yeah saw saw waterfalls coming off the cliffs there down down to the sea um there on, on the weekend somebody posted some shots of that so i might take a look at that too so <laughs> yeah yeah 
Yeah, that's what I think. I think. I think um, being in South Australia, loving the water. I think this is generally a pretty dry state. Yeah. So, uh, so I might have done a boo boo there, but we'll we'll see. We'll you, see. Well, I mean, you've you've got one of those uh, very rare opportunities, I guess. If you if you head north up to Lake Eyre. Uh, yeah. you know, there's there's a lot of water up there at, at the moment, from what I understand. So, you know, yeah. as you said, taking the salt pans, you'd probably be actually taking small lakes in in some of those locations now, because uh, there'll be one for wet. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of water coming down from uh, Queensland and uh, Northern Territory at the moment, and uh, I think that's that's going to make a, a a bit of a difference to. The, the the desert for a for a couple of months anyway till it till it all dries up. That's it, bound to yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess um, go on. I, I was I was going to say that uh, uh, I think I think over the last couple of years I think I was primarily shooting um, jetties. I think if you go back on my Instagram feed, it, it's just it was like pieces of stick in water. Um, or jetties in water, obviously. And uh, I think my latest passion at the moment has been trees. Um, I've, uh, I think I think that's where I've sort of shifted away from the jetties. Um, having shot a lot of them and shot a lot of them several times, I've I've uh, expanded or changed um, somewhat. And so I'm really excited. About about getting the camera out in in lakes, especially lakes full of water, of course. So yeah. that's my next, I think, um, uh, passion. If I'm not the seaside, I'm gonna uh, uh, here in South Australia. We've got Lake Bonnie, and Lake Bonnie is is just you know it's a photographer's dream. Yeah, um, yeah. so many trees. Even you photograph one tree about three different ways. You know, it's just. It's insane some of the some of the uh, the trees that are up there. So uh, it's only a small hop, skip, and a three-hour drive. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how we go. Yeah, definitely. So, do you have any sort of routine that you know you you set up? Obviously, you've you've got your uh, planning done, your image in mind, and so you turn up on location. What? What are you what are you thinking about what are you what are you looking for what are you what what are you doing with your gear well, well normally normally when I normally when I turn up and, and of course it's way pre-dawn uh, I've already generally decided on the first shot so that's usually eight eight minutes ish sometimes a touch longer but it's, it's an eight minute image I just uh, just the eye surf necessary and and the aperture so that it's I get my eight minutes. And again, that's you know, that's I wouldn't say it was luck at the start. I think I think I, I I generally nail nine out of ten now in terms of focusing on the right thing and actually getting the exposure correct, even though it's pitch black. So so my first image is generally planned um, because it, it has to be because I'm in I'm in complete darkness. Um, after that, after that, it's it's more about reacting to the light at that point. So and and also um, uh, trying to get the best. So to to compromise, then it's a to compromise between the light and the object, whatever it is I've come to photograph. And it tends to be an object. I tend to photograph as if it's a portrait rather than a landscape. So uh, I tend to focus on a single object. Yeah. Um, sometimes with without a foreground, uh, it depends on what level of uh, how strong that image is. If that image, I believe, is strong enough, it doesn't need a foreground, then I won't, I won't give it one. I'll just make it centre stage. So yeah, so it's it's a compromise once the light's starting to come up between where the light is and how best to use that uh, against the subject, which side, what what perspective, high, low, to one side, to the other, straight down the middle is best to capture this thing, whatever it is. And into that mix is often 
is off in the flow. Um, so I do do shorter, much shorter um, uh, exposures. So so if Moran rocks, you know, quarter of a second, couple of seconds, not got a problem with that. Um, but for the longer ones, it's more it's it's about uh, how how much wind is there, what direction is it, which way are the clouds going. Um, definitely the light. How can I use the light? Is there any color left? Uh, and it's a it's it's everything in the mix. It's usually a crazy twenty minutes. Yeah. At that point, I have no idea which way I'm going to be pulled. Um, it it tends to be uh, it it tends to be the light will dictate first. The light will change. I'll react to that and suddenly go okay. The lights here, I've got the clouds going this way, I've got the water there, and I've got this object. How can I put those four things together in some sort of jigsaw that feels right to me? Yeah. I'll be ducking, diving, left, right, up, down. And somewhere in the middle of that, I'll just stop for us. I'll just I'll just stop and I'll go, no, this is it. This is what I want to, want to take. And then I'll shift the camera, set it down. Uh, I'm on autopilot then. I know uh, I usually know how long I want that exposure to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know what depth of field I'm going to need. And of course, um, how, now shooting medium format, it now m- often means that I have to focus stack because yeah. um, yes. depth of field works differently um, for medium format than it does on full frame. And believe you me, I, I lost a lot of images when I first went to, to medium format for exactly that reason. I thought F-16, you know, I've got a jetty in front of me. I'll focus a third of the way through. Bingo, done. Yeah, I can walk away. Happy days. No, nah, doesn't work like that with not, medium format. Not quite the same. Yeah. <laughs> not the same. Oh, you, you talk F-16 on uh, full frame is about F-11-ish. Yeah. I, I, I think it's about 12 um on medium format for the same focal length so you need to focus stack yeah yeah you're forced to focus stack and of course i've had to adjust how i photograph and how i approach it to make sure that i get my long exposure and and i'm able to focus stack as well so yeah it 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 slows you down a little bit but then you have to speed up changing conditions to get what you want it's a, it's a challenge yeah. um yeah medium format has been a real challenge but um when you get it right the the feel and the look and the files are just you know they're just amazing so yeah so what, what do you do in speaking of files obviously medium format's going to be uh you know getting up what what is it 100 or 150 megapixels or yeah, often often uh, around uh, one twenty to one sixty megapixels. Yep. Yep. Um, what, what are you doing for storage? Because that that that's going to eat it growing. up. <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's growing quickly. Um, I'm I'm looking at uh, a NAS. I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at big storage, uh, possibly within a year. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, I've got four 18 terabyte drives. Wow. Okay. And I've got two 12s and I've got four eights. Um, as because I, I have three sets of, of, of backup. Yeah. So I have things from the past and they're backed up on the eights and they, they're basically, I fire them up once a month to make sure they're okay. Yeah, and yep. I make sure they're out, they're both working. So they, these are external drives, yeah. External, yeah, yeah, they're all external. Um, I've got a couple of SSDs um, that I so when I'm when I when I bring new files in, I'll put them on the um, SSDs. So I've got two two terabyte SSDs side by side, and I'll work off them because I need that speed. Yep, and yep. then after that, they get they get bumped to the backup drives. Got it. Um, which have set up, I've got some software on the Mac so that once I make a change, um, just before I switch off, I run the program and it mirrors them across the four. So just to make sure that I've got uh, redundancy built in because I've lost I've lost a lot of files in the past 
Um, yeah. Just having them on a single drive. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm the same. I've uh, moved from uh, single drives to multiple externals, but I've also uh, signed up with a, um, a cloud service as well, which luckily basically doesn't have a limit, which is nice. Okay. Not, yes. It's not the cheapest out there, but it's also not the most expensive. Um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, I, it makes me feel better because it's just sitting here quietly picking everything up from the hard drive on the computer as I'm yeah. working on it and just, you know, putting it away. So if anything does happen, and as I say, touch wood, it, Indeed. You know, yeah. I, I won't need it. But uh, I yeah. have been considering that, so I might, we might chat about that at some point. Yeah. So no, the, the, what happy. you recommend. Um, but yeah. So what I tend to do is, is the drives I have, when I've finished backing them up, I pick two of them up, put them in a box, and then they go out in the shed. Yep. Uh, just in case, you know, you know, God forbid, but something happened to the house. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I've got I've got them backed up in the in the shed, and then um, then I have to halfway through editing, I go, oh, damn, I've got to walk out to the shed, bring the drive <laughs> back in, plug in. But I try to separate them so that I've got, you know, a redundant set somewhere else. So yeah, uh-huh. yeah. But they are mighty files, you know. You're talking. Um. Uh, uh, the, one of the one of the uh, the panoramas that I did um, was you know overall was a, a two uh, two million megapixel file. Wow! Yeah. You know, you're talking ridiculous, uh, ridiculous. And I got to the edge where um, the software I was using, uh, Lightroom wouldn't wouldn't photo merge them. Yeah, Photoshop yeah. Wouldn't photo merge them. Um, I've got capture. Capture one that wouldn't do them because the new one will 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 photo merge to um, panorama that wouldn't do it. So I ended up using uh, um, another another piece of software that that did do it uh, full yeah. you know, full resolution. So yeah, yeah crazy I, crazy files. I've I, I've found uh, one one of the ways I've got around some of those things where you know. Photoshop or one of the others won't process like a, and it's usually, as you say, in the, in those panos where you've got multiple um, and because I've, I've also bracketed. So, um, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever the exposure width is, so you say it's, you know, five shots, then each of those shots is five exposures. Yeah. <laughs> um, you end up with some uh, massive files, but what I, what I've found is, doing breaking up the processing into separate smaller parts and then doing the photo merge with those final yeah. effectively already processed single sets of images or sing, sing, single uh you know shots that I'm single on. file compressed file yeah, yeah. so basically the, it, it, you're only dealing with the jpegs at the end to actually do the stitching because the stitching okay. itself is you know, not necessarily the, the the hard part. Depends on the size of the file and how many files I've got to play with. Sometimes I do it the other way around where I do the stitching and then use those stitched files to do then the blending and editing. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah um, the, it, it does put a pressure, a little bit of pressure on you on on your on your computer gear. But yeah, yeah. You know, I try to I try not to do as I'm trying to do as little editing. As I as I as I possibly can, um, I try, but uh, I, 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 I I've gone back to earlier earlier edited photos, looked at them, and thought, how the hell did you ever think they were any good? <laughs> you know, you know, so I'm re-edited them much, you know, much more sympathetically. I think. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, yeah. I I definitely know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just get. Uh, Addicted to sliders, I think you just yeah. Every slide is meant to be pushed. Yeah, well, like everyone it. everyone starts off with the hundred percent saturation, hundred uh, percent vibrance, you know, and then yeah, then you learn. Okay, well, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> uh, that's 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 right, and, and yeah, and I think that's the the every image now that I do uh, nautical twilight one that works out. Uh, I have to bump. 
the vibrance and the saturation down, often saturation 5%, but vibrance down by 10, 15% because yeah. they're just unearthly. They just do not look, they don't, they don't look real. And even then they're very highly, highly saturated, but they're natural, you know, um, yeah. the right no, files, that, that's the thing with those long exposures is they do tend to, uh, look a little oversaturated, and I, I, I've done the same myself. You know, I've, you know, take, taken saturation down even up to fifteen percent in some cases. Where you yeah, know, yeah, you, have to. You, you look at it and you go, no, nah, it couldn't look like that. <laughs> that's, 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 that's exactly it. And and the other thing as well, because it because it averages out the light, it, yeah. it tends to dull the contrast. So so you got to be careful putting contrast back in. Yeah, um, because what that will do is really push the colours back up again. It's just you're in a, it's a no-win situation. You need that contrast because you've taken it out because of the long exposure. Yeah. And you, yeah, and it's increased saturation, but contrast will increase that even more. That's, so, that's exactly it, yeah. So I, 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 I tend to do um, uh, what's called zonal contrast. So looking oh, yeah. at um, the mid-tones, looking at the shadows, looking at the highlights, and then just subtle changes to each of those to it gives you a lot yeah. more so basically what you're doing you're using a, a, a luminosity mask to actually you know control which pieces oh, those areas you're yeah. you're changing and then just use a, a, a curves adjustment to adjust those um okay. and it, it gives you a lot more control over what gets changed by what contrast yeah. rather than doing a global contrast change which you know as, as you well aware can give you some strange results. <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, well, that, that 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 zonal that, that's an Ansel Adams, isn't it? I think yeah. he, that's what that was his approach um, way back when with film. He used the zonal approach. Yeah. So, well, but that's uh, you can see now why why black and white so much easier. Absolutely. Than, uh, than working with color, but yeah. <laughs> I, mind you, I've seen I've seen some interesting. Um, I uh, forget what his name is. The guy that does uh, F64 Academy, um, he's got some interesting stuff that really opened my eyes around how to how to go from and and use your colours to control what your black and white tones okay. are. And yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll flick you a link to to, yeah, to that tutorial. It's it's just a, a very different way of looking at that black and white conversion. So you're taking a colour shot, but then yeah. you're a conversion using uh, hue and saturation uh, layers and, and changing, um, you know, the various values depending on what colour range you want to change. You know, so you, okay. you, you, you want to bump the reds up or down or the blues up or down and the yellows and so forth. So you're actually getting a lot more control over your tonal range. Over and, that, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And, and, but this is this is the fascinating thing about it for me, you know, in terms of processing. You know, a lot of a lot of people don't want to talk about their processing and whatever because it's, you know, they it's just their way of doing things. And you know, that you, you get into that routine and you get into your workflow and you it works for you and it gives you your style. But I I, I like I, I like playing around a little bit to try and learn more about the tool and what it can and can't do and you know sure. what what you can do to get more control over more of you know more granular control as as I guess what I mean around you know what you're yeah. doing with your images. Yeah, no, no, I can I can hear there's just uh there's 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 only so many hours in the day. Really yeah, that's that's the other thing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I I try to I try to limit my processing but Every now and then, when you're really, really enjoying an image, um, you know, it's that that point of time where you look across and, oh my god, I spent an hour on this. Yeah, you know, it's just where does that go? <laughs> you know, yes. Have you have you ever thought about um, infrared photography? Funnily enough, I haven't. I, I sorry, I'll 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 rephrase that. Yes, I have thought about it. Have I done any of it? No. Have yeah. I actually experimented with it? Not really. No. It is something yeah. that I'd like to take a look at, but um, you know, it. Uh, and I, I think it'd be interesting, actually. You know, talking about your uh, your eight minute uh, nautical twilight exposures, whether or not that makes any difference. 
you know, flipping your, your, your camera into infrared mode and, yeah. uh, you know, see, seeing what what your eye definitely can't see. <laughs> yeah, well, again, that thing where I push it to the limit, uh, when, when I, I've, uh, I no longer have the Nikons, I've only just got rid of them just before Christmas. I kept them as my safety net in case I didn't like the Fuji. Yeah. Um, uh, but the 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 D eight hundred, I was going to keep that and get it get it converted, so that I wasn't going to mess around by doing infrared in in software. I, I, I was yeah. considering actually having the sensor swapped and yep. having a dedicated sensor in there. And I and I may still I may still do that. That's something that's it's tickling in the back of my mind. You know, uh, now that you say, I never even considered an ultra long exposure in infrared and what that could possibly look. See, you've got me excited now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I better, I better hand the card to the wife because. Hang on a sec, uh, patent copyright Grant Swinburne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I, I, I've got to be honest. I don't know too many people that are doing the nautical twilight in the first place, and I'm pretty sure there's very few people that have played around with infrared in that space the, yeah. I, i'm quite sure doing a google search will find somebody that's that, that's done it but, I'm, uh, I'm sure i'm sure we have <clears throat> yeah i think uh since posting uh on instagram you can um before claiming that it was nautical twilight i think photographers were out there photographing during that time and maybe yeah. didn't have a label for it yep. Um, yep. But i have noticed that it's become uh, it's more popular. I've, I've, I've noticed since uh, I've been posting, and it may, it may just be coincidence, um, but more and more photographers, especially on my feed, are out a bit earlier, and and, and I think they, they're just getting addicted. It, it just means you've got to get out of bed an hour yeah, earlier, which is that's harder. That's for exactly it. Yeah. And that's, to, for me, also the hard part. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I force myself and... It is difficult sometimes, um, especially, you know, it's, uh, we're still in the midst, you're not, but we're still here in South Australia in the midst of the dreaded blue sky, you yeah. know, so the thought of getting up and driving at half past three, four o'clock in the morning when you know it's going to be a blue sky is, yeah. it, it can it, be a bit. Isn't that when you do Astro? <laughs> and, yeah, but that's, that's one thing that I've, I've never, I've done it once. Yeah, I've done it, I've just done it once, and it was only, only because I I couldn't sleep, got up, went, and there was not a cloud in the sky, and I thought oh, I'll give it a go, and it wasn't too bad. It turned out quite well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's uh, it's I don't know. I think Astro's beautiful, and I think the people that do it do a damn fine job. Um, and I'd. Yeah, it's just take, take some dedication to get out there, particularly in the middle of winter, which is our you know Milky Way season. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, be be there for eight or nine hours. I know. Um, uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Chungi photos or um, Hisu Chung is his his name. Okay. Um, he's he's does these uh, amazing. Uh, dust till dawn shots so oh, yeah. you'll see the sun setting in the west and yeah, then rising. the you know the the full you know gamut of stars and everything with the the landscape done at twilight and then you'll see the sun rising in the east you know yeah. he's there you know taking the multiple shots that it takes to create these amazing images you know and yeah. it's yeah, just just phenomenal dedication to actually sit there with your tripod set up you know and with, the, yeah that time slice i've seen i've seen quite often those time slices uh, yeah well, this, this is this is blending all of those into into a single cohesive wow. image. yeah the, well well worth well worth I'll looking. have a little look, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that is dedication. You know, I suppose if we were, if it was our one and only business, I'm, I'm still working full time, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I only get out, I get out of a weekend, um, probably once, uh, but um, now and then I, I might be able to sneak in a weekday um, photo shoot or something like that, but. Yeah, imagine imagine seven days a week just, you know. 
Yeah, for yeah. me, it's a little bit closer than uh, closer than you may think. I've had a uh, you know a, a couple of changes with work, and um, at the moment, I'm uh, I'm basically full time photography and podcasting. Uh, that's that's yeah. all I'm doing at the moment. So it's not that I'm out there every day because there's other things in life to do. You know, there's uh, yeah, indeed. Yeah, you know, are you enjoying it? Yeah, absolutely, T- totally. Um, you know, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a lot better than working for a living because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Uh, when, when you're doing it, it doesn't feel like work. You know, <laughs> no, that's true. No, that's absolutely, absolutely right. Um, I hope I enjoy it. I hope I enjoy it just as much when, 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 when it's available for me all the time. I'm not sure whether the excitement and the the highs and lows are because it's limited to me. I'm yeah. not sure. Yet. So it's, yeah, I, I, it's a nice I, way of finding it. I mean, it's only, it's only been a few months, so I, I, I can't say that the the passion will live on for, for you know, how long it'll live on for. But, um, yeah, certainly so far um, haven't... Uh, ha- haven't found anything where I'm sort of saying, oh, I don't want to do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I've got to say, Grant, as well, that, you know, I thoroughly enjoy the images that I see of yours as well. Oh, thank um, you. They really, really do. You know, they they do stand out. There's there's probably about there's probably more, but there's about a dozen. There's about a dozen people who, uh, when I see the name before I scroll up, it's like I scroll and stop. Yeah. You know, and then I, I stop and enjoy the image. Um, whereas you know, there's a, a lot a lot you just. You, you know, you flick through and it'll only catch your eye, but there are certain certain photographers out there that you just know that th- there's something to learn, there's something to see, there's something to feel yeah. in the picture that they create. And I know you exactly. are you're definitely one of them. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, you, you, you're very much the same for me, you know, one one of the ones that I always uh, stop and take a, take a good look at because, uh, you know, I, I guess talking about Instagram and, and social media and so forth, where 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 are you with that at the moment? Is it just Instagram that you're sharing your work, or are you doing more with it? Are you trying to sell prints on a website? Or um, well, I do, I do. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got a website, although it's uh, uh, it, it's uh, <laughs> poorly looked after. I update it probably every six months or so. Yeah. You know, and then haphazardly throw some of my favorite images up, and then, and then I, I forget about it. Um, I I do use Instagram. I, I I'm a lot of people are down on Instagram. I quite I still quite enjoy using it. Yeah, I think because I'm not really I'm not really bothered on 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 the likes. Um, if it does well, then people enjoy it, then great. And if they don't, then I think to myself, well, the right people haven't seen it. Yep. So, so for me, it's 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 fine. Yeah. Uh, I I do enjoy it because it because it's colourful when you see all when you scroll to your feed and you see all your images and it's it's powerful. You know, it's it's powerful to see a platform with your work on. I suppose even though you've put it up, yeah, but yeah. I do enjoy that colour and I enjoy I interact with a lot of people on Instagram. Yeah. So there's a lot of people who ask questions um direct questions regardless of in the feed um and a lot of a lot of beginners who say really like to do this how do you do that and i just i, I enjoy talking to them sure. um uh, and and so yeah so no, for me instagram is it, well, some people say it's a tool for them. I quite i enjoy the interaction that i do get on there so yeah. uh, while that's while that's working for me and other people are enjoying talking to me on that uh, i'll stick with that Facebook's not really, um, I've not really attempted to use that in any real way. Mm. I've got a personal account, which also has my photographs on. Um, there's a whole collection of people. It's not a focus for a, a business or selling prints. I don't try and sell prints uh, or force the sale of prints in any which way. Sure, sure. I'm just happy if people want them, um, then they'll, 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 they'll ask me. Um, you know, do, you, do you print many of your own shots for your for your own walls, or? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I do. I've got, um, I've probably got in the in the hall behind, which is behind you. 
I've got three of my favourites, two black and whites and a uh, and, and a colour. Um, and the colour one's actually from South Australia that I took when we holidayed here we're from Victoria. Yep. So I've got I've got those. I've just ordered um, four um, A2 metal prints, you know, an alum, aluminium. Um, and they're all of Lake Bonnie. Um, so I've ordered those to come in. They're going, they're going out, they're going out for an exhibition. Um, so they'll go in the exhibition. When that when that exhibition finishes, they'll go on my wall. Yeah, great. So uh yeah, over time I've probably got about 10, 12 uh pictures that have been framed. Um, but I get I suppose I get quite bored of them. I think yeah. having your own stuff on the wall. So I've got on my wall. I've got other photographers' stuff. Yeah, okay. That, that I've that I've um, that I've purchased over over the years. So I've got about four or five of other photographers' stuff, which goes up, and I don't get bored of them. Yeah, uh, I move them around different rooms, but I don't get bored of those. Like I do my own, I suppose. It's just. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it, it, I, I, I kind of get where where you're coming from there because you know you you've created it, you've looked at it, you probably, I mean, you thought about the image before you went, you stood there in front of it and taken it, and then you've sat there and processed it for maybe up to an hour, maybe an hour and a half if you, you know, <laughs> if you've really worked it, and mm. now you got it hanging on your wall. Do you really want to look at it anymore? You know? <laughs> I think I think I think you've captured it. There, there is something in that. It, it's it's I want I, I don't know I suppose uh, maybe it's this hubris thing but maybe maybe I want someone else to enjoy it yeah um, because yeah. because it's I've I've enjoyed the entire process and if I'm happy with the final image I don't need to be reminded of that yeah I don't need to see it all the time um so so it's possibly something along those lines have you ever uh, hit a creative wall. Um, several times. No, several times. Um, I, it, it's usually it's usually before I go out, so I won't go out. Yeah. Um, uh, so th- there's many occasions where I've set the alarm for four o'clock. Four o'clock's come. The lights, you know, the, the alarm's gone off. I've woke up, and I've just gone. No, you know, I've just gone. I'm I'm, I'm just not going to do it. And it's often. When you look out the window an hour later, the the, the most amazing sunrise yeah, should've, should've ever yeah. in the world, <laughs> and you kick yourself a bit. But then, no, if I'm if I'm if I'm if I'm not there, I'm I'm not there. Um, yeah. Has it? I'm trying to think if it's lasted. I, uh, no, I don't think I don't think it's. I, I've probably had it for. I think the maximum I've had it for two is about two weeks, where I haven't gone out, but I I tend to get quite ratty. Yeah, I, I, I tend to get a bit tetchy. I think if I haven't had that outlet, so in in the end, often the wife just kicks me out the door with the keys in my hand, <laughs> says, "Don't come back until you've done some photos." Um, I, I, it's it's mainly because if I'm out and it's an absolute rubbish, awful sunrise, and every photograph I've took has been ruined either through camera shake or there's just nothing to take, that doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter to me because the sun's come up. Yeah, I've yeah. seen I've, I've I've seen it go from dark to light, and I do feel that that's sort of a um, an emotional physical reset for me, and that's why I enjoy sunrise much more than sunset. Yeah, I couldn't think of anything worse than staying out all day, setting up for your shot, and walking away with nothing, and then having to drive home for an hour and a half. I couldn't think of anything worse. Yeah, I've I've done that a couple of times. So I've got to admit. Yeah, no, <laughs> I I have too. But um, but at least if I'm driving home in the morning, an hour and a half, I can stop somewhere and have breakfast, yeah. and and the rest of the days there, you know, yeah. it's just yeah, it's a different dynamic for me. I do enjoy. I don't mind going out at three o'clock in the morning, and then coming home tired. Yep. Uh, even if I'm tired for the rest of the day, go to bed early. Um, but yeah, no, that buoys me up. It, it does have an impact, I think, on my mood uh, and my outlook. So yeah, once a week, I have to watch the sunrise. Yeah, fair enough. If um, 
actually, sorry. What do you what do you like to do when you're not out shooting? If I'm not out shooting, then uh, well, we're in, we're, we moved into this uh, ancient house, so that consumes an awful lot of time. Uh, but if I'm not out shooting, um, I read quite uh, prolifically. Still, I'm re- I read um, uh, voracious. Um, uh, movie watcher okay uh, so but but mostly uh, I, I still I still read an awful lot so I think that consumes a lot of time and and again if I'm not taking photographs I'm often as I said earlier I'm on Google Maps and I'm, everything is about um, it's about images it's about the geography it's about the story of the land it's yeah so I'm always I'm always busy I think, uh, yeah, and of course I I, I do um, um, a vlog now, so I'm often editing um, video that goes along with the images that I put up. So, cool. so yeah, so you're talking a one episode is a day's edit. It's, yeah, it, so you've got to spread that through the week. So it's an hour a night or an hour and a half a night to get that done. Yeah, uh, hope so. Yeah, it does does take a bit of time. I know it's kind of similar with the edits on the um, on the podcast. As as I said when we first started, I don't uh, I don't spend a, a massive amount of time editing everything, but you know, cleaning it up, making sure that the intro and the music and all that sort of thing is all together and where it should be, and yeah, it does it does take a little bit of coordination. Plus, then there's the, all the very slick. Yeah, no, they're, very, they're very good. They're very slick. Um, I'm still, I'm still all at sea with mine. I'm just, I just switch the camera on and then just babble most of the time. Um, <laughs> Let's see. That's that's why I invite guests so I don't have to do the babbling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's clever. That's clever. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, I, I, I've got to say, I don't like the sound of my own voice very much, so I, I skip over the bits where I'm talking. And uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone does. Well, no, if they do, avoid them. Yes, uh, that's it. probably is probably the <laughs> way to go there. Yeah. Uh, yes. Anyone who likes the sound of their own voice, you probably uh, don't want to be near. <laughs> no, no, that's true. Uh, they're probably a politician, but yeah, we'll leave that. Yeah. So are there any uh, photographers out there that you think uh, need to be spoken to on the on the podcast? Um, uh, there's um, there's uh, CC Images on Instagram. Yep. So that's uh, Craig. Um, can't remember his surname. It's in my head. Craig Crossway, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, Crossway. He's he's a, he's a he's a great photographer. Um, I think I think my claim to fame is that. Uh, on, our, on his first real shootout, we met each other, and um, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I whipped out my filters and started setting my tripod up with my filters. And he was suitably impressed. He told me that he went out the following week and bought a set of filters. So, <laughs> so that I suppose is, is a claim to make. But uh, but he's a he's a handy. He's a real good photographer. Yeah, I like, um, I like Craig's work a lot. Really though. nice guy. He is. He's a, he's, a, he's a great guy. Um, and I suppose uh, uh, there's, a, there's a there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of American photographers who who, who I speak to quite regularly. So that's uh, Paul Cook. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, and there's a so if you're talking around the world, there's a um, there's a couple there's, there's a couple in the well, there's one in Ireland. Who's a fantastic uh, uh, photographer, and then there's there's, there's, a, there's a there's a there's a female photographer, uh, Lynn Luxon Jones. Okay, yep. She's uh, she's 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 handy with a camera. She's very very good. Um, she often says she's not as good as anyone else, but you know, uh, her work's as good as any I've seen coming out of the UK. Yeah. Um, she she's 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 a smart cookie. Um, her long exposures are just yeah sublime. She's a very very good photographer. Again, it's part time, but uh, she's got a healthy healthy uh, following on on YouTube. But she's very very good. I'd recommend her actually. Okay, thank you. 
Hey. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure how the time zone difference would would work, but she's uh, she's great. She's really good. Yeah. Uh, she inspired me to to actually create a YouTube channel. In terms of, I liked, I, you know, I loved the work, and uh, and that easy way in which she just chatted to camera. She made it look easy, which I which I found out it wasn't when I first tried it. Um, but yeah, no, I'd probably say she's she's pretty good. Oh, fantastic. Oh, I got one uh, last question for you, and uh, for many, it's the the most important question I can ask, and that's whether or not you like pineapple on pizza. Ah, right. Okay. Uh, I actually, I don't mind pineapple on pizza. Uh, I think if you're going to have pineapple on pizza, you've got to have pineapple and olive. Okay. At the same time. So, so you get the sweet and the salt. Uh, and and you get the salt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's got a good to have life in balance, I think. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. It is. And not everyone likes, likes olives, so... Do you know what I mean? So you, yeah, no, you, can, I get spread, yeah. you can spread the hate. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time out uh, to talk to me, Izzy. Um, it's been fantastic to hear about what you've been up to and uh, you know how you do what you do. Where can people find your work? Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, I suppose it's Izzy Abalela on uh, on Instagram. Uh, there's there's only one, <laughs> as long as you don't spell the name wrong. There's there's only one, or on YouTube. Uh, my my website is is a is a bit of a mouthful, and it really needs. I need to change the domain. Um, so it's it's photo mead, and then there's a hyphen ia. So it's photo mead. Yeah, but yeah, no, it's awful. Um, forget that. <laughs> uh, I think it's Instagram. I'll put a link in the uh, description. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a terrible it's a terrible uh, domain. I don't know what I was thinking when I when I thought that one up. Uh, one too many gins, I think. Fair enough. Um, All right, thank you, uh, mate. It was uh, it was really good uh, having a chat to you. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work and this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.